even though I have a standing desk in my office, I do tend to get stuck in my sitting desk. So I need to create some sort of routine to to get up out of my sitting down desk. I know that's not a great thing. But we didn't, don't have to be perfectly healthy to come come on your show, which is yeah. brilliant. Power to Live More with Joe Dodds. Welcome to the Power to Live More podcast, all about productivity, organisation, well-being, energy and resilience. I'm Jo Dodds and I started this show to enable interesting people to share their stories about how they use their power to live more and by that I mean to do the stuff that they want to do more than the stuff that they need to or should do. It's about creating a life for yourself where you have the energy, health and space to be happy and fulfilled, spending your time as you'd like, whether that be at work, home or somewhere else entirely. That's your choice. Hello, my name is Ellie Dodds and I'm co-presenter. And today Joe is interviewing Dr Penny Pullen of Making Projects Work Limited. Penny and Joe first met when they were in the first stages of running their own businesses. Via a marketing conference and forum, they've stayed in touch over the years, worked together and masterminded together. So Joe is really pleased to be introducing Penny to the podcast. Dr Penny Pullen's latest book is Virtual Leadership, Practical Strategies for Getting the Best Out of Virtual Work and Virtual Teams. Other books cover topics such as facilitating risks, leadership and people in projects. Penny works with people who are grappling with tricky stuff, risky virtual teams, ambiguity, disengaged stakeholders. To this complexity, Penny brings clarity, confidence and powerful communication including graphics that will make work more successful and much more fun. Penny is a director of Making Projects Work Limited, a consultant with clients all over the globe, a keynote speaker and acts as a mentor to a growing number of independent project professionals. Back to the studio. Today I'm interviewing Penny Pullen of Making Projects Work and author of the soon-to-be-published book, Virtual Leadership, Practical Strategies for Getting the Best Out of Virtual Work and Virtual Teams. So welcome, Penny. Thanks for joining me. Thanks very much, too, for asking. Great to have you here. So start by telling us a bit more about what you do, who you are, and where you do it. Okay, so I'm speaking to you from the attic room that is my office in the market town of Loughborough, which is in it's slap bang in the middle of England. Um, I've been doing this, running my own company for nine and a half years now, um, having escaped from the corporate world um, in about yeah the beginning of 2007. Inside um, the corporate world, I'd been an internal consultant for a big company. And so I sort of transitioned into doing that externally. And the people that I work with typically are in big multinational companies and they're grappling with having to do tricky projects. Now your listeners might um, might think, what does she mean tricky projects? Well, here's how I explain tricky projects. They tend to have four elements, which are the bits that I help people with. One aspect is that they're really risky. So you have to be able to work with uncertainty and things that might upset your objectives. The second thing is that um, they often have uh, ambiguous and often changing requirements to what the project needs to do. So that's an important thing to understand. So I do a lot of work around that in business analysis. Um, the third thing is that often there are people who ought to be involved in the project who would probably far rather run screaming down a corridor in the opposite direction than actually come along, show up and do stuff for the project. Joe, it sounds like you might have had something like that in the past, maybe. <laughs> Absolutely. The, four, the fourth one, and the one that we'll probably touch on a little bit more this time, is where you are doing projects, but you don't have everybody together in the same office, that the people who you rely on to get the project work done are distributed. They're, they could be all over the country. They could be all over the world. And that those things brought together are what I call tricky projects. And there are a lot of people grappling with them. 
And typically when people work with me, and that could be maybe coming in to do a, um, a course for their company or perhaps individual mentoring. I work with quite a lot of um, contractors who are working in that sort of environment in my Signing Outsiders group. Um, what, when they work with me, they find all sorts of things come up, and typically it's lots of C's, so commitment to projects by all these people who the project leader doesn't have any um, authority over, but they need to get people to do things. So these people become committed, there's a lot of com good communication, people collaborate and work together. And then there's another one that doesn't fit the C's, which is actually people have fun and enjoy doing the project, which tends to lead to better outcomes and better learning for people involved as well. So yeah, that's what I do. Lovely. And are you tending to work with people like you who are working from home or, that, or do they generally work within organisations in, in you know, offices with other people? Most of the people um, that I work with are working in companies in offices, but the people that they actually work with themselves may be all over the place. So what I'm finding is that although people are employed, often employed by large corporates, they're actually spending quite a bit of time working from home as well. Mm. Um, so, I mean, there's somebody I was interviewing for my book who was talking about how he'd been working virtually um, for many years, and he was... He normally works from the dining room table at home, although he's not an official virtual worker. And funnily enough, the day I was interviewing him, he couldn't work on the dining room table because his wife was having some friends around for lunch, so he had to move off somewhere else. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I wonder what, you know, how does that change your environment, your productivity, if you have such a, such a, um, really what should be quite a temporary working environment but he'd been doing it for years and years yes and have you always had your own office at home whilst you've been working from home yes I have and actually it's wonderful it's on the top floor so when I leave work I shut my computer down I shut the door and I go downstairs Yes. And once I'm downstairs, I'm in the home environment. We've got all the bedrooms and so on on, on that floor. And at the top floor, it is just offices. Mm -hmm. So that really suits me. And I'm so lucky to have that because I think if I did have to work, say, on a dining room table, for me particularly, I would just never stop because yeah. it is fun. I love what I do. And I, you know, people tell me it makes a difference to their confidence and, and their ability to do some really tricky stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. So tell me a bit more about, about how your day starts then. Uh, now you've, you've described the office at the top of the house. I'm imagining that you, you know, do the morning <laughs> routine stuff with your children and then, and then disappear up the stairs. Is that true? And, and how do you uh, make that all fit together? <laughs> it does. Well, I'm quite lucky now to have teenagers. Just thinking about that, I wonder how many people would say that. I was going to say, the word yeah, lucky, lucky and teenagers. teenagers. <laughs> and <laughs> and they, they actually get themselves up and then they go out of the door at about 20 past 8 on their own. So actually, I think if I didn't get out of bed, they would still be gone by 20 past 8 with everything they needed. Um, I suppose some days there would be a sort of, Mom, can I have some money for something? But other than that, yeah. Um, so that's all much smoother than it was when they were, when they were much smaller. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I saunter up to, to my room and get going. Of course, and how with every, everything being so mobile, you know, I can, if I want to, sit down and do some things on my phone before breakfast while I'm waiting for my porridge to cook or whatever it might be. Um, I'm thinking, actually, it would probably be better if I didn't do that. Perhaps yeah. I should ask you about productive morning routines. <laughs> it's interesting. It's something I'm focusing on quite a, a lot at the moment, and I, mine has changed considerably because I've sort of, followed along with the things like the miracle morning and um the guy, the people who talk about you know getting up at five o'clock in the morning when I say I followed along I've read about it I haven't actually got up I read about <laughs> it and I thought you've got to be joking <laughs> um because I'm a bit of a night owl so getting up early really doesn't suit me and I did yes. try a sort of six o'clock no. six thirty thing for for a few weeks but it, it really doesn't work with our sort of family routine but mm. what I have started to do is block out my diary in the morning so that I don't generally have any mm. calls until after lunch interesting so that I can mm. you know I can have a routine or I can be very flexible and I can work on the sort of important stuff for my business mm. before mm. I get sort of bogged down in 
in other things. So um, that's yeah, interesting. That, that's interesting, Joe, because I wonder if you're more of an introvert than I am. Because for me, if I do that, what happens is that I get sort of sucked into um, a state where I don't actually do very much. And for me, as an extrovert, if I have some interaction with somebody early on in the day, then that sort of sets me up for the day. Mm, mm, gives me yeah. some energy to get going. Yeah. So I suppose the real thing is that actually we're all, we're all a bit different and we need to know what works for us. Absolutely, because as you say, that some people would hear the word introvert and, and know me and think, don't be ridiculous. But actually, uh, that is a lot of how I am. And, and my perfect uh, world mm. in my office is actually being here on my own and not talking to anybody, which, you know, amazes <laughs> lots of people. Um, but as you say, that, so for me, not speaking to people and, and doing mm. my own thing and, and having routines and structure mm. internally, mm. if you like, really suits me. But it doesn't suit you know a lot of people as you say oh. mm. I've been a little bit like that actually I've had to flex my inner introvert it was really inner and hidden away by um when I was writing my book because this is my third book but it's the, the very first one I've written on my own mm. I did interview lots of lovely people for case studies but it's only my name on the type on the cover page the first book I wrote jointly with Ruth Murray Webster. The second book I actually was asked to write myself and then invited 27 other people to write it with me, which was slightly... It was, we had a wonderful launch party. It was just brilliant <laughs> because we had most people there. Unfortunately, not everybody could be there somewhere in, in the US or Australia, but it was brilliant and it was great. But maybe it's a bit much. So I then I swung back to the other end of the pendulum, which is writing on my own. And I think as an introvert, that's probably not where I'm going to be in the future. But, you know, you need when you're writing a book, you want to make it the best you possibly can. So you pour your heart and soul into it. Mm. Um, and and that's, that's kept me going. But um, as an introvert on my own is not my most, not my best state, put it that way. Um, and... Uh, so where where I'd say as a, as an introvert, I like to uh, or self professed introvert, I like to spend that time on my own and work on my own. You're saying the opposite. What what sort of impact has that had to just be working on your own to do the book? Um, well, I think it's it's about it's maybe not introvert in terms of the sort of di dictionary definition. It's more sort of the Jungian definition. That's getting a bit heavy, isn't it? Well, it's where your energy comes from. Yeah. So I think for you, Joe, is your energy, you replenish on your own or yeah. with small groups, whereas yeah. I go to a big group as a workshop all day and I'm in seventh heaven mm. and I'm all buzzy and I've got loads of energy, um, whereas I know other people who do that for a day and they just have to hide somewhere to recover. Um, so for me, it, it's been making sure that I am doing things with other people, obviously spending time with my family, um, doing some pieces of work that take me out with others and mm -hmm. obviously using using the time I have outside of work where I, where I do things that involve other people as well. Mm. But just being, it's made me even more aware that, you know, my best place is, is normally doing things with others. Talking, I think best thinking things through, talking things through out loud with others who are interested as well. Yeah. So... And I think, that I think the, I've verged into doing lots of case studies and interviews and chatting to make sure that I could check ideas yeah. and things with others. Yeah, I think the key there is knowing yourself, isn't it? And sort of trying and testing things and working out what mm. you know, what does make you feel energised and, and what doesn't and then doing more mm. of mm. whichever, you know, works the best sort of thing. So, uh, you know, that's really key. Mm. So you talked about... Um, the end of the day and having the advantage of shutting the office door do you have any particular sort of routines in the evening to, to make that happen and then after that to sort of take you into to the evening in the right sort of uh, frame of mind if you like I don't know if you can call it a routine but teenagers get really hungry so <laughs> if, you, if you're not around to provide food at the appropriate times they come and bang on your door <laughs> and sort of start coming in and sort of you know um miming dying of starvation and stuff so um yeah they drag me out um in, the, in requiring food but something that i've done now i'm into my just past my four, four year mark is i'm actually learning to play the violin and as somebody who runs their own business it's been incredibly useful 
because I I don't know if you have ever played the violin. I have an inkling that you might have I did. for a short I did. while. I got to grade six uh -huh. when I was at school. <laughs> grade six. Whoa. Well, you you're beyond me. Slightly. Um. So I've been doing this for four years now. And I started mainly because I love music and I thought it would be fun to be able to play along with my, my kids who, one of them is learning about, well, she's on the go, she's about four instruments at the moment, but yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I started learning the violin with her, but I realized that when you're learning something that complicated and you have to think about all the different elements, so the music, the how you're making the sound, what your left hand's doing, what your right hand's doing, no tension anywhere, there's just so much to think about that all the sort of business stuff that tends to be going around around my head all the time has no place. So it gets pushed away. Yes. And my brain is completely occupied by, um, by this. And now I find, because I am at the stage where I'm playing some absolutely incredible music, that um, I do. I, I get completely um, taken away from all the business and it almost seems to sort of settle while I'm away doing something different mm, mm. Um, yeah so I normally do that for an hour often quite say, late really, at night yeah. <laughs> I was reading an article about um, sort of learning things including musical instruments the other day and it, it mm. was saying how, how important it is to sort of learn instruments that you haven't played before as well because I I Yes. I play the bassoon still and the recorder and I sometimes mm. play those and as you say they you know they give you something to focus on but because I can play mm. them reasonably well unless I push myself mm. a really complicated piece um, mm. it's probably not as effective for what you're just talking about um, according mm. to this article you know that that you, you sort of almost need to have multi-dimensional learning going on for it to be really really valuable yep. see how the yes mm. yeah there's certainly multi-dimensional learning going on when I'm trying to operate the bow and have my fingers going fast enough. I'm doing the Bach double concerto at the moment, and it's amazing music, but oh boy, do you have to be accurate. Yeah. Anyway, so there we are. So that, you do that, that every that, night, um, just, to, just to be clear, just to make me feel bad about the I should do. about once a week? I should do. <laughs> just, I, I should do, but I'm learning, you see. I'm progressing. Yeah. So I'm sort of moving. I'll probably, in a year's time, I'll be at the stage you got to on your violin. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Lovely. Well, you're putting me to shame. I'll have to, to get the bassoon out more often. <laughs> I don't want to put anyone to shame, but it's just been, it's, it was an, an interest that I had for a long time. And then just finding it so incredibly um, great at clearing my mind of all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's change the subject a bit and talk about getting stuff done. I know when we talked before about uh, sort of setting up the interview, you were saying uh, maybe you might not be the sort of um, the poster child for, <laughs> for getting things done. And I absolutely <laughs> disagree because everything I, I've known you a long time and everything I see of you is, is you know, you're getting stuff done and you're always doing lots of, of um, good stuff. And m most people don't write a book, never mind three books. So um, so I, mm -hmm. I sort of I'll, I'll disagree with you a bit on the productivity thing. So <laughs> how do you get stuff done? How do you manage yourself in that way? Well, I know that I can do some things incredibly fast, and sometimes I am incredibly fast, and I surprise myself. And then other times, I sort of get to the end of the day, and I think, what happened? <laughs> I seem to have achieved absolutely nothing. <laughs> so um, as you're speaking, I was thinking, gosh, if this is a podcast which is highlighting, you know, the most productive people and what they do, then, Joe, I'd better bow out. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I suppose... Um, I'm doing stuff that I love doing um, because I do run my own company. Obviously, I need to fit in with the needs of my clients, but it's a, I've found this tricky project and all the aspects around it. Um, it does really make a difference, and that's really what drives me, thinking about the other people that will be affected. I mean, I, I hate the thought of anybody being stuck in a big corporate, whether they're an employee or a contractor, having to do a huge project and thinking, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, it, this is just a nightmare and stress city. And just knowing that what I do does change people from that to be people who are actually enjoying making a difference and making a bigger and bigger difference, um, you know, as they develop. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's, you know, it's the effect on other people. 
Yeah. So, so getting this stuff done, how, how do you do that? Do you use particular tools or the one that comes up a lot at the moment is pen and paper? <laughs> I always think it's going to be yeah, really busy. Actually, what I do an awful lot um, is I use, I'm also a very visual person. I've doodled since I was very tiny. I then did engineering right up to a PhD um, level. And the thing that I learned as an engineer is that you get these very complex, tricky problems. And the, the way that you solve them is by drawing them out with a pen and paper. And then once you've done that as an engineer, you can write down the maths and solve it. So actually, I think really what I do is I use visuals and I use pictures to understand the incredibly tricky and complicated situations that my clients are in and the sort of complex elements that they're working with. Yeah. Um, and I found that by using very simple graphics, that not only does it help me to understand the complexity, it also helps my client to understand what's going on. But then it turns out that it has some really powerful other things as well. So it really helps people to remember the different aspects. So when I draw things out, it helps me to remember, and it helps the people that I've drawn that out in front of remember what it is that I've drawn. Because it sort of sticks. You don't have to concentrate and think really hard to put something into memory, as you would need to do with a long list of words. Pictures just pop back into the brain. So that's really powerful. And the other thing I find, just going back to virtual leadership, is that um, if you do drawings when you're working with people virtually, they actually find them incredibly engaging and they stay on the line and they, they, you know, they can add in their own drawings as well, even better. And that's something really powerful because with virtual groups and virtual teams, one of the hardest things is to keep people interested and engaged. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You so, are yeah. one of those people who will just always pick up a pen to describe anything, won't you? Which is interesting. I, I've it's, it's never been something that I've done. So you know, you go to meetings with people and mm -hmm. start talking about something, and they get a notepad out and they start writing down what you're saying. And I always look at that. And yeah. think, Why are you writing it down? <laughs> because that's just <laughs> my way of doing it. But I've yeah, you know, yeah. been in some meetings with you, and, and having had a meeting with you online a couple of days ago and, and you actually were, were sketching out w with images as you said what we were saying as we were yes. going along it was really helpful it was really helpful that was to make sure it's clear for me but then it it shows you that I'd understood what you would got yeah. so actually you had a taster of how visuals really do clarify things mm. I've had so many people saying to me Penny how do you do those visuals um, that I actually a few years ago set up a site site called graphicsmadeeasy.co.uk which um, gives three months worth of um, once a week tutorials, just simple stuff that you can use um, for business. Yes, yeah. So maybe that might be helpful for somebody yeah, and it's free. Definitely and it'll definitely be in the show notes. <laughs> Okay, so, so let's move on a bit then. You've talked a bit about um, your music and your violin for relaxing at the end of, of the day. How else do you um, firstly relax and, and also, ha oh, I'm going to cough, and how, how do you keep yourself healthy? Well, a bit like the productivity. Um, I do seem to be quite lucky in, in having a fairly healthy um just being, being pretty healthy, um, despite the fact that even though I have a standing desk in my office, I do tend to get stuck in my sitting desk. So I need to create some sort of routine to to get up out of my sitting down desk. I know that's not a great thing. But we didn't, don't have to be perfectly healthy to come come on your show, which you is don't. brilliant. You don't, exactly. The things that I really do your, enjoy... Your standing desk, have you got two separate desks? I have two separate desks. Yes. And does that mean that you have to move a laptop from one to the other? I do. Ah, I have two power supplies, though, yes. and I have Wi-Fi. So there's really no excuse. Well, you see, but I can tell you, I used to have that very set up myself. And um, uh -huh. I would use it quite a lot, and I would often start standing, so that sort of gave me more yes. incentive. Um, yep. But it was a bit of a palaver, and I would, like you, get stuck doing sort of one or the other. And then I was really mm. lucky to be at a conference, um, uh, an exhibition a few weeks ago, and got chatting to somebody um, from a company called Ergotron and um, they have very cool contraptions that you put on top of your desk I don't think they call them contraptions 
<laughs> that actually yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they raise and lower and they have a stand for yeah. your laptop and all that sort of st- stuff. And um, I was describing my homemade stand up desk made of a bookshelf, mm. some books and lots of bits of wood um, and how, you know, mm. sort of uh, Heath Robinson it was. And um, he clearly saw an opportunity um, as he was the sales manager and had some opportunities to um, to uh, get people to try their their contraptions mm. um and they and they especially bloggers and so on yeah mm. so they've basically given me one to use and try Whoa. and talk about so i here i am talking about it because um aside from the fact that that's what's happened and they've not put any pressure on me to actually say anything about it <laughs> um, i absolutely mm. love it and to be honest i hardly sit down now i sit down to keep my knees from hurting but other than that it's mm. much more comfortable for me now to stand um even though Brilliant. i don't have to faff around i literally just pull the clips and lift it up and pull the clips and lift it down. And it's, it's, or, you know, it's not even lifting. It's just sort of dropping it down. Um, so it does, it's interesting. You think that even if you've made it easy, which is what I did, I had two power supplies and two mm. screens and everything. Mm. You think, you know, that, that, that there's no, not a barrier, but I found out there was a barrier and actually now I, I stand, mm. you know, mm. the majority of the time, which is really interesting, but I think it's such a good thing to do. Mm. I've done a lot of research mm. about how, well, they say, mm. don't they, sitting's the new smoking. So, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I do have a, a rather super duper lovely big space for drawing with pens on clean space on my standing desk. So that does draw me over there sometimes when I want to, you know, really write things down yeah. with pen and paper because it's a, a, a nice, empty, beautiful space. Yeah. So all you need to do is attach your um, your um, tablet to it that you do your drawing on as well. And then, then you'll have yeah, no yeah. excuse for sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So you asked me what I liked. Other things, um, yes. especially this time of year, walking in the woods. Yeah. I, I'm lucky to live in the middle of the country, um, away from big cities. So within five minutes, I can be in beautiful woods, ancient oak, oak trees, bluebells carpeting the floor and so on. So, yeah, very lovely, de-stressing, doesn't feel like... Um, you know, running on a treadmill or anything, but it is, you know, brisk walk around the woods. Mm. I've been looking out at the sunny day all day today with little Dodsey off sick from school, wishing I was walking around out there because it looks really nice. So, <laughs> yes. It's snowing and hailing where I am. Oh, no. <laughs> no we have had yeah. that this week, but it's, uh, it's really sunny. It's very windy, mm. but very mm. sunny at the moment. <laughs> oh, okay. So what about... Um, learning and improving yourself I know from having known you for a while that uh, that you are constantly uh, looking at what you can do differently and better oh well, that's the perception that I have how, how do you do that what do you do absolutely well I, I read books voraciously so actually probably what a lot of what goes into my own books um, I have long, long reference sections and further readings because I pull together all sorts of ideas from different areas and I love doing that I also do some online um, courses with people um, and I probably a day a month or so, actually maybe not quite that much a day every couple of months I will be going off to something either a conference or something where I'm learning face to face with people um, yeah and, and that works works well or meeting up with people who are interested in things obviously this is this extrovert thing coming in again you know the online learning when you've got hours or days worth of video to watch on my own in my office um i get slightly rest restless but will do it if i know it's a good thing yeah whereas actually learning with others is is quite good and i learn so much when i run my own courses yes um yeah i'll be sure any of us who do that find that yeah Yeah, i was gonna say you'll be sort of not unintentionally is perhaps not the right word but uh, you know when until you start doing it you don't realize what you do learn mm-hmm. as, yeah. but then they say don't you that you need to teach to learn so I suppose it would automatically yeah, follow yeah. that even if you're teaching things that you know about you will still be learning as, mm-hmm. you, as you do that mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah okay you said you read voraciously me too what sort of uh, <laughs> books do you read what books do you recommend well I tend to read lots of non-fiction books which are around the edge of the stuff that I'm interested in so one good one that's come out very recently is how to have a good day by caroline webb i met caroline at the end of last year and found out about her book she's an ex mckinsey consultant who ran their remarkable leadership program or was very involved in it 
and um, during that time tapped into research around what is it that makes people really incredibly effective. So she's probably a good person for you to have in your podcast. Yeah, definitely. But, um, so, so that's a good one where you can read through all the different things, um, all the different aspects of life and find out, you know, what's the latest research on that. And there's some quite surprising things that come up out of that, um, which is good. Um, going back to one that's a bit older, there's, uh, there's a book um, that I read years ago by Benjamin Zander, which is around the time um, that I was thinking of setting up my own company. And... Um, absolutely transformational, and I can't remember the name of it, which is not very good. <laughs> oh boy, it, it's got a yellow, it's got a yellow fly cover, um, and it's all about change and and not not being not being the um, ah, it's it's yeah, <laughs> the art of possibility, ah. Benjamin Zander. That's the one. Yep. Yes, it's it's an amazing book. Um, yes, and the art of possibility. When I read it, I was in a corporate, big corporate, and thinking, do I take redundancy or do I move to where they want me to move to? Mm. And yeah, it, it was yeah, very good, very good. Lovely. Yep. So what about um, other forms of uh, entertainment like films and music? You've already talked to, about um, the classical music. <laughs> do you, do, you, uh, do you partake of, uh, of films and, and uh, concerts and the like? Yeah, I've got, in fact, my older teenager, my older teenage daughter, Kathleen, is, is a complete film buff. And despite the fact I keep reminding her that DVDs are likely not to, and not to really exist as a format for very long, of course, she's not been through the changes I've been through in my life. She's now insisting of buying every a DVD of any film that she likes or that anybody recommends to her. So she's about to go through Doctor Zhivago, I think, um, mm -hmm. this weekend. Um, and she's yeah, she's got a massive collection, and we often watch things together. Yeah. Um, the Shawshank Redemption is probably my favourite. Me too. Um, not as in relaxing, but very powerful. Yeah. 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 Hmm. And what about music? Do you do, you do oh. other than classical or just the classical, which I also love? <laughs> um, 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 well, I quite like musical theatre. So, mm. you know, I'll sing along to Les Mis um, and so on. But um, I'm not really massively into, into anything else. Mm. Um, yeah. And tell me, do you listen to music while you work? Because I always have this conversation with people. I have to listen to music that doesn't have words that I don't know particularly well. Otherwise, I even sing along, even if there are no words to it. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. I don't normally. Um, I've got all the setup that, that I could. In fact, there is, I do use music um, in my workshops. And um, there's a very good little book called um, Using Music in Training or something like that. Yeah. That actually explains how all the different types of music impact on um on your on the brain so for example if i'm trying to do something very creative or getting groups to do something very creative i would tend to play them completely unknown world music that they won't have come across before because as you say um you know music is a very powerful hook if you know something it'll hook you back into the emotions that you felt the last time or perhaps the first time that you that you heard it mm. which isn't always the emotion that you would that would be most productive at the time yes yeah that is true yeah mm. Okay, so what about if things don't go right? What about if you have one of those days where it's all just gone a bit wrong? What, what do you do? How do you deal with that? Well, tomorrow is another day. <laughs> yeah. What can I do differently tomorrow? Yeah, that's life really. I mean, I think when I was 20, I would have beaten myself up about it and thought, oh, well, that, what a waste, what a waste and blame myself. But there's absolutely no point in doing that. So, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, tends to be my my view on it, and, and maybe a bit of wine and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that sounds good too. Yeah, and maybe so, go and uh, go and attack. Yeah, if I'm feeling yeah, if I'm feeling sad, really sad about something, I will go and play laments on my violin, uh, and um, and it all the feeling will pour out, and then I feel a lot better afterwards. Yes, yeah, lovely. Yeah. Hmm. And what about a day when you end the day knowing that you've had the chance to live more? And I mean, 
do the stuff that you want to do rather than the stuff you feel you have to do or, or should do? What, what will you have done? Probably I would have, yeah, I would have made a difference to an individual. I'm realizing, um, you know, I thought when I started up this company nine and a half years ago that it would make a big difference to companies and it would change them. And it does, but it, every, the difference is by the difference. It's person by person. Yeah. So a day where I can, in fact, today, um, I've just had a message from somebody who I've been able to connect with some other people who need a really inspiring conference speaker and they want, they're going for diversity. And I've recommended somebody that I've mentored. And I've just, in fact, while we were doing this, I probably shouldn't have looked, but I did, <laughs> received a text saying, um, wow, just looking back over the years, thank you so much, Penny, for what you've done for me. I'm short of words. Oh, wow. And, you know, if I stop there, even if I don't finish this conversation, I'll think, yeah, that's what I'm here to do. That's what I'm on. That's my purpose on earth, if you like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's really nice. I like that. Wow. So, <laughs> bit of an introspective moment there. Um, so, that's really the end, end of the interview. It's um, It's been, I think, quite... Um, We've gone deep in some areas, which I always like with our with our uh, interviews. Mm -hmm. I like the ones where we share lots of tools and apps and things as well. Um, but um, I think some of the sort of uh, psychological stuff is really really interesting and, and mm. helpful for people as well. So, how can people find out more about you and, and connect with you? Yeah, well, I'm on Twitter at Penny Penny Pullen. Now, just remember, I'm a funny sort of Pullen. My husband's <laughs> family comes from Yorkshire, so it's. Penny is P E N N Y and Pullen is P U L L A N. Yeah. There are lots of other Pullens out there that spell it differently, but I'm P U L L A N. And in fact, if you type Penny Pullen into Google, I'll pop up all over the place because I do seem to have a fairly unique name, which is quite which is quite a good thing in internet days. And I'd be very happy to speak to anyone. Um, the, my book, Virtual Leadership, we haven't really talked about that very much, but it's my sort of latest um, thing. I hope will make a real difference to people who, who can't be with all the other people that they're working with at the same time. And I know you're really aiming at people working from home, and I hope that this will have lots of things for them as well. You might think leadership is all about leading, leading teams. Actually, anyone who's doing things virtually does need to be able to lead others and connect with them and engage with them. And I've poured in my experience. Um, I start off working virtually when a, when when the 9-11 tragedy happened, really, because I was meant to be flying to New York two days later to launch a massive global program face-to-face -face with everybody, and we had to suddenly do it all virtually. And, um, yeah, I thank goodness I took to it and have been working virtually ever since. So anything from that that might help anybody else, um, you know, happy to chat with people online, chat on Twitter, um, email, it type Penny Pullan A N into <laughs> Google and I'll pop up. Do get lovely. in touch. That would be great. Yeah, lovely. No, I'd, I'd really um, sort of pleased that that you've made the point about the the leadership um, piece being for you know lots of people. As you say, I think it can be misread as as being people who manage teams in a um, you know the the more sort of traditional mm -hmm. specific way that that you you think of when actually you know leadership as a concept is is nothing to do with. Uh, yeah that really yeah. it's about you know an individual taking the lead in some way for something with somebody or some people and it doesn't necessarily absolutely team does it so so joe you're a leader you're very much a leader you don't sit in a corner office with a large number of people who report into you mm -hmm. but i think you're probably more of a leader by stepping up and doing this podcast and doing a lot of the work that you do than many many people in corner offices Mm. and many people listening to this are your leaders yeah more than those people sitting in corner offices yeah you're changing the world absolutely absolutely even if your office does happen to be in the corner of your house <laughs> <laughs> or the corner of an attic room overlooking the snow outside or whatever it might be exactly exactly yeah. well thank you penny i've really really enjoyed uh, speaking to you today thanks for joining me been lovely. Thank you so much, Joe.
Oh, the book is available even though this is coming out just before it's published. Look on Amazon. Joe's Jams. This is the part of the show where I do a recap of the key points of the interview, the stuff that I really liked, and the apps, books, music, tips and tools that were shared. This is for you if you heard something that you want to check out, but you couldn't write it down at the time. Hopefully I've got you covered. And this is the bit for the really time-pressed. You can just listen here and get the gems from the interview. But of course, I wouldn't suggest you do that and miss out on the great conversation that I had with Penny. We talked about using graphics to simplify explaining things. Penny uh, talks about using graphics to help her to understand what's going on when there's uh, tricky, complex situations to discuss, but also so that her clients can understand as well. And certainly I, I commented on the podcast that whenever I'm with Penny, she does tend to grab a pen and paper and start drawing things out as we start having conversations, which is not something that uh, I would naturally do. But she says it helps her to remember and it helps the people that she's talking to to remember. It sort of helps things to stick um, because pictures just help your memory um, as opposed to, to words. And then she talked, talked about virtual leadership, which is her current specialism with the book that she's recently published and saying that if you actually are working virtually with people, but then you draw when you're having meetings with them. So she uses quite a nifty iPad app that uh, enables her to uh, draw things on the iPad and put them up onto the screen. She says it's really engaging and it really helps to keep people uh, inter interactive and interested in the, the conversation. And then she has a, a site that she set up herself a few years ago, ago called graphicsmadeeasy.co.uk where you can get three months worth of once a week tutorials explaining how to create graphics um, within your business. When we talked about books, we talked about a book called How to Have a Good Day by Caroline Webb. And Penny said she met her last year and she's an ex-McKinsey consultant who ran their Remarkable Leadership Program. And she tapped into research at that time around what really makes people effective. So that's where that book came from. And also a book that Penny read when she first started her business by Benjamin Zander, which is called The Art of Possibility. She called it absolutely transformational. And then Penny talked about a book that she uh, has used to help her to use music in her workshops, and that's called Choosing and Using Music in Training. When we talked about music, Penny said she quite likes musical theatre, um, sings along to Les Mis, but not really into uh, anything else particularly. And we'd had a lot of conversation about music as she uh, plays the violin and has been doing so for the last few years. And she talks about music being a very powerful hook and says if you know something, it will, uh, or if you hear something, it will hook you back into the emotions that you felt the last time or perhaps the first time that you heard it. And that isn't always the emotion that would be most productive at the time. So how important it is to be aware of that and make sure that if you are playing music when you're working or doing particular things that you pick the right sort of music. A couple of films that Penny mentioned as being uh, really good is Dr. Zhivago and uh, one of my favourites as well, The Shawshank Redemption. As I said, Penny talked about playing the violin and she talked about how playing it as an adult, she realised that when you're learning something really complicated and you've got all the different elements that you have to uh, do, so the music, how you're making the sound, what your left hand's doing, what your right hand's doing, not having any tension. She said there's so much to think about that her business stuff sort of tends to go right out of her head. It gets pushed away and her brain's completely occupied by the music. And uh, I mean, that's something that um, I understand. I, I sing and uh, when I'm singing uh, complicated pieces of music and I'm trying to read the music and get the timing right and be in tune and all those other things, it's really quite mindful because that's all you can focus on. You can't worry about other things at the time. And I also talked about an article that I'd recently read Talk, which talked about learning musical instruments and it was saying how important it is to learn them um, and particularly instruments that you haven't played before because then you have that multi-dimensional learning going on as Penny talked about with all the different uh, nuances to it, all the different elements of it and that makes it really valuable. We talked about Outstanding Desk, which I think we've talked about on other podcasts. And I was saying that I was at a conference a few months ago and a company called Ergotron uh, very kindly offered me a... Um, a standing desk contraption, as I called it, although I said I don't think they call them contraptions because <laughs> I'd been describing to them the uh, homemade stand-up desk that I had with a bookshelf and some books and bits of wood and things to stand on and all this sort of thing. Um, and um, Penny and I were talking about how much you use a standing desk 
Um, and because I've got one that's now just all on the same desk and I can just raise it or lower it very easily, I do tend to stand quite a lot. Um, whereas when I had a separate stand up desk to, to my sit- sitting desk, because I had to sort of plug things in and unplug them and that sort of thing, even though I made it easy with uh, two power supplies and two screens and so on, I still didn't do it very often. So I spent a lot of my time sitting when I really intended to be standing. Uh, so I do think in lots of things that we do in life, if you can make it as easy as possible to do the thing that you want to do, then you're much more likely to do it. If you have barriers, however perceived they are, however you know real or perceived they are, then they, that can quite often stop you doing things. When we talked about exercise, Penny talked about uh, walking in the woods locally to where she lives and how it's very de-stressing. She says it's not anything like running on a treadmill, but it does give her that sort of uh, exercise and mindfulness. Penny said how she, how much she learns from teaching, that she learns so much when she runs her own courses, where clearly she is the subject uh, expert, but also learns so much from interacting with the people on the course. When we talked about what happens when it all goes wrong? She talked about the phrasing, tomorrow is another day, and what can I do differently tomorrow? And she talked about when she's feeling sad, then she um, goes and plays a lament on her violin, and all that feeling comes out, and then she feels a lot better afterwards, which I thought was an interesting way of sort of dealing with that those feelings of sadness. To contact Penny, you can contact her on Twitter. She's at Penny Pullen, P-U-L-L-A-N. She was very keen to point out. <laughs> and she says if you type Penny Pullen into Google, then she comes up. Um, it's quite a unique name, so you can see all the different uh, places that you can find her. And then she has her new book, her latest book, Virtual Leadership, which she says she hopes makes a real difference to people who can't be with all the other people that they're working with at the same time. So, you know, it works for sort of organisations where they're working virtually, but also if you're an individual working from home um, with your own business maybe and you're working with other people uh, as you know VAs and and other virtual team members then it it may be useful for that too and you can find that on Amazon or if you go to coganpage.com and do a search for Penny Pullen then you can buy from there with a 20% off coupon and you need the code VLF20 and that's capital so VLF20. And all this information is available on the show notes on powertolivemore.com forward slash 24. Use your power to live more. All this information is available on the show notes on the website powertolivemore.com forward slash in this case 24. And if you'd like to sign up to get my weekly newsletter with more tips, strategies, ideas and tools to improve your power, you can do that on the website too. And do come over to the Facebook group. If you go to powertolivemore.com forward slash Facebook, that'll take you into the group. And uh, if you go to powertolivemore.com forward slash focus, you can download my free report about how to increase your focus for better productivity. Again, the link for the show is powertolivemore.com forward slash 24. And we look forward to speaking to you next time. 